the discussion from a train between Zurich and, and Frankfurt. Uh, hope the connection will be stable. Put my mask. Um, hope the sound is not too bad. Uh, the European Federation of Journalists is, is very happy to, to offer you this uh, webinar together with the European Commission and its directorate, DG Justice. Uh, we've always believed that journalist organizations have a duty to promote professional ethics, quality journalism, uh, journalism which avoids simplifications and, and polarization. Uh, you know it, we, we, we live in an increasingly fragmented uh, world, more and more difficult for citizens to understand. And journalists have a special responsibility, a special duty uh, in, in this context. Our role is to help citizens better understand the world in which they live uh, with all uh, its nuance. It also means that, that we need to better understand and better explain the situation of ethnic and, and religious minorities. We must avoid stigma and stereotypes and not out of activism, but, but simply because it's part of our basic job, which consists of uh, reporting the truth, reporting reality, reality as it is and not as people imagine it. So thank you to the registered participants. Thank you to our great speakers, Laila and, and Mikhail. Uh, Laila and Mikhail uh, will do everything to interact with you as much as possible. And thank you to Tommaso Ciamparino, who will tell us a few words on behalf of the uh, European Commission. The floor is yours, Tommaso. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. It's uh, nice to be with all of you. It's nice to see also you, which with, <clears throat> with a more moved uh, and uh, uh, background than usual. We're now used to see to see all our uh, living room uh, backgrounds only since some uh, a year. Um, I'm very I'm very happy that that this uh, initiative is starting. Um, and so I would like to thank uh, Ricardo and, and UCLAN for having uh, put it together. Uh, it's a series of webinars that we strongly wanted from our side. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm very glad to, uh, to see that it is seeing the light. Um, my name is Tommaso Chiamparina. I'm the Commission Coordinator on Combating Anti-Muslim Hatred. I work in the Directorate General for Justice in the Commission and in particular in the team that, that uh, deals with uh, combating racism and xenophobia and having then a specific role in um, dealing with, with specific forms of racism and intolerance when they uh, are addressed against uh, Muslims or people perceived uh, as being Muslims. And as a coordinator, my role is to prompt or to help policy developments to uh, achieve uh, this goal of tackling, of tackling um, hate crime and discrimination uh, uh, against Muslims. And in, in my work, uh, in my daily work, I'm confronted, thanks also to what I receive in terms of information by research or by uh, activists that from the ground are working to counter Islamophobia. And some are today with us in the room. I'm, I'm seeing Anna from, from Greece, Pedro from Spain, Laila, Michael, and others. What I hear is that, and, and what we see from research and reports is that um, Islamophobia, anti-Muslim racism is a worrying phenomenon throughout the EU. We hear testimonies of episodes of racism, hate speech, discrimination in access to employment, uh, to education uh, and, and services. Um, where in fact the negative uh, uh, biases uh, on, on grounds of religion mixed sometimes with, with ethnic grounds and other grounds are uh, at the origin of, of such discriminatory acts. We are observing that often uh, the sparks uh, of hatred, intolerance and hate speech in particular on online uh, happen, for example, in, uh, in the aftermath or following um, terrorist attacks 
perpetrated by uh, Islamist extremists. Um, I just received the other day research done on France, which shows that uh, in the days immediately after the killing of Samuel Paty in October 2020, uh, it has been observed a 800% increase of hate speech against Muslims on social media. Uh, why I'm saying that? Because that shows, I think, it's one example of uh, the reasons we're, uh, we're sitting in, in, this, in this training and when series of webinars today all together, and the responsibility that many people like us, policymakers, uh, um, people with public responsibilities, media and journalists uh, have in um, making sure that negative uh, prejudices and negative stereotypes are not fueled in particular in delicate moments like uh, uh, the one that follow or are around uh, terrorist, uh, uh, terrorist acts. Um, because when we look at hate speech, discrimination, uh, racism, there is obviously behind of each single episode, there is a perpetrator. Uh, I hope you can hear me, continue to hear me well, because I received messages about my connection on stable. In case, just uh, raise your hand. Um, but behind every perpetrator, there is society where they live in uh, and a societal context where, unfortunately, uh, all around Europe, uh, some negative biases, prejudices, and stereotypes proliferate and uh, against uh, targeting in particular uh, Muslims, people perceived to be Muslim because of their religion, because of their faith and associations are made often uh, between an entire community, an entire religious community and some, um, some uh, fringes of extremism. And so this is where uh, we, as, a, as, as I said, as policymakers, politicians uh, uh, have enormous responsibility. Let me just make one example. Uh, I, came, I came across the other day, um, a, a, a few days ago, as you, as you all know, uh, the, the month of Ramadan has started and uh, uh, politicians often, when they, when, when they are, are said to do that or, or, or firmly believe about, about the intention of doing that, uh, share or put tweets out there uh, to uh, wish, uh, to, to share the wishes, for uh, to all the Muslim communities for the Ramadan. But there are ways and ways in doing it. And uh, I came across two different ones, which I wanted to share with you. I will not sh share the screen, but just describe two heads of state, one a little more conservative, let's say, and another one uh, a bit more liberal and progressive. In one, it was saying basically best wishes for uh, to all the Muslim community for the start of the Ramadan. And then second sentence was, but please watch out that you respect the rules uh, imposed by the COVID situation. The, uh, the other one was saying, best wishes for the start of the Ramadan. We know that it is a different situa difficult situation for you, very different. And we sympathize with you in this phase where you have to celebrate uh, probably in isolation or in, in, in a certainly different way than uh, you, uh, you're used to do. So you see this kind of very, same message, but conveying in such a different ways, can have an enormous impact, I think, in the framing of the whole thing. Because one message like the first is implicitly suggesting and framing as if there was a problem uh, by uh, the Muslim community as uh, a risk that they are behind the possible spread of, of the virus. Whereas the other one was showing full sympathy and uh, uh, and empathy with uh, with fellow citizens. So this is uh, just an example on on the uh, on the responsibility and on on the importance of uh, narrative storytelling and the way messages are framed. And media operators and journalists like you here in the room today have uh, also an important role to play in a, in in this. Um, uh, in these efforts. And uh, so that's why we look forward for the uh, process that will start today, will continue for uh, a series of, of webinars uh, across the month of, uh, of uh, April and May, and then with a final event uh, in June. Um, 
we count a lot on this because uh, we see you uh, on the one side as uh, key fundamental agents of change to make sure that through, as Ricardo put it, ethical um, quality journalism, the narratives, the storytelling about Islam as Muslim and Muslim is, is put forward in, in, a, in a balanced uh, way that does, not, uh, that does not fuel stereotypes, but also because you might have a key role in becoming an um, ambassadors for uh, these kind of messages to come across into your community of fellow uh, journalists and in the context of uh, press rooms across the EU. So um, I'll stop here. I'll give the floor to uh, Euclid back uh, and uh, Michael and Lila that will entertain you uh, and, and run you through the process and the first uh, episodes of our series today. Uh, but I'll stay on. So if you have questions uh, uh, or anything about uh, what we do from the side of the European Commission, uh, I'm here to respond to them. And so thank you very much and enjoy the session today and in the coming weeks. Thank you, Tommaso. Maybe uh, I would like to invite everyone to, uh, uh, to give a very quick uh, introductions of yourself and uh, very briefly tell us also uh, why you would like to be um, in this uh, webinar and how you what you expect so that we also get to know each other and know about your background and also also know about the challenges you face that you might say that how we can also um, continue in the following uh, some uh, webinar how to we can uh, help you or how we can um, discuss the issue further. So um, do I have volunteer or can I see? Please feel free to. I hope I did not miss anyone. If I miss you, please let me know now. Otherwise we can continue. So finally, I'm Yuklan Wong. Uh, some of you know me, I'm working for the EFJs and I also working uh, on the projects and on issue of uh, Muslim uh, related project issues. Um, for quite a while. So welcome all of you. Um, we know from what you said, we all share a very common passions on the subject and the drive to improve the reporting on these issues. So I would uh, not delay anymore and also begin our section. So the first, uh, I will pass it on to Leila. So in this section, we'll really uh, want to hear from also voices from the Muslim and Islam community also, what are the me um, media perceptions on, on this community? What are, what, how they see also media portraying them? Some of you already mentioned already these uh, misconceptions. So um, I will pass on the floor to Leila. Leila? Yeah, can you hear me? Can I share my screen with you? I think it will be easier. Yes, I think you, you should be able to share it. Try. Yeah, we can see your screen. Just to check if it Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry for this technical issues. Okay. Think that it will be better like this. Okay, so thank you again for uh, having me. As I said, I'm the head of the frontline service uh, in the CCIB, Collective Against Islamophobia in Belgium, and that's why I think that I was invited today to share with you uh, our experience of Islamophobia uh, in the media. But before starting, I just want to tell you that, as you may have noticed, I'm not fluent in English. It's not my mother tongue. So if you don't understand something, feel free to interrupt me and ask me to rephrase. And I'm already, I already apologize if I'm not nuanced enough uh, and so on, because as I said, I don't master real English, but um, feel free to interrupt me. Okay, so, uh, okay. I don't know um, if you shared the question before, no, uh, if you received our, my question, but I can skip this part if uh, you planned. Because normally uh, we have planned with UCLAN that we will have a pool to share before, 
Yes, I have. Uh, I can launch the poll now. Uh, when do you When do you want me to launch it? You can launch it now if you want. To. Okay, just a second. Should I stop sharing my screen? Um. Uh, no, it's okay. Maybe just give me a minute to to launch it. So basically, with Michael, with we thought that it will be interesting to have a pool before our intervention to get to know you better and to know what experience you had with uh, this topic as journalists. And after that, we will uh, share with you our experience and uh, we will uh, come back on this question. Okay, I just have some technical problem. Maybe my colleague Laura can launch the poll. Don't worry if it doesn't work, we will uh, speak yeah. about. Uh, are you viewing the poll right now? Yeah. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> So maybe we can give you a two, three minutes to answer to your question. You can, is it okay? Uh, Holy rates, you made it. Um, so there were 16 out of 26 have now um, answered the question. Maybe we can wait for half a minute more. Yeah. Leila, can you see the results? No. No? Okay, so only I see the results. Okay, see then it. maybe let's go through them uh, for question one. Yeah. Does the media outlet feature the voices of Muslims in context outside of violence and public safety, and does it include them in stories about subjects that concern all citizens? From the people who answered, 76% said yes, and 24% said no. Okay. Question two. If you have reported about Islamophobic individuals, organizations, did you check all the claims made by these individuals, organizations, and did you seek opposing comments? 76%, <laughs> exactly the same, said yes, and 24, no. Okay. Question three, if you have reported about a topic related to women's experiences, did you pay a particular attention to also include the voice of women from minorities like Muslim women? 82% said yes and 18, no. Great, the results are really excellent. So thank you very much for answering to this. So let's go with my presentation. Oh, okay, now I see. Well, next time I know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Sorry. I'm gonna just try to skip this. Ah, okay, got it. So uh, here is the agenda of my presentation. So as you can see, before diving uh, into the topic, I think that it will be interesting to briefly uh, uh, introduce uh, the CCIB. And as we speak about Islamophobia, I think that it's uh, good to share with you a brief, defini uh, brief definition of uh, the phenomenon. 
And um, after that, uh, to be honest, uh, to speak about this topic today, I mainly rely on uh, complaints that we usually receive in the CCIB uh, concerning Islamophobia in the media. And the main issues that are reported to us, as you probably guess, are uh, related to uh, cartoons, uh, double standards or irrelevant languages used by some journalists and the treatment uh, of Muslims women in the media. After that, I think that it will be uh, interesting as well to share with you some study cases that we had at the CCIB and I will finish uh, with some uh, recommendation and leave you some additional res resources to go further. So, uh, I can't move this. So about us, uh, the CCIB is uh, Belgium, uh, as the name says, uh, anti-racism organization which was created more or less seven years ago with uh, the objective of tackling Islamophobia in Belgium and on internet. And to achieve this goal, we usually work with more than 20 uh, partners from civil society to institution and at different levels. I mean, at local, national, European, as well as international level. Um, our priorities are th uh, three. Uh, first of all, and the main priority of the CCIB is to help victims uh, of Islamophobia by giving them support and to establish a permanent monitoring uh, of Islamophobic Act. We also try to do our best to facilitate full inclusion of Muslims and particularly Muslims women in higher education and employment, because this field are uh, the field where uh, Muslims women find uh, a lot of obstacles. And finally, we try to raise awareness on Islamophobia and build structural solutions with authorities and society to counter the phenomenon. So, uh, what, uh, what is Islamophobia? So, to us, Islamophobia is, as you can read it on the slide, a specific form of racism that refers to act of violence. And this acts of violence includes hate speech, harassment, discrimination, and so on, perpetrated against at least one person, a good, or an institution, an institution because of the real or supposed belonging to Islam, culture, and religion. This violence could be economical, psychological, or physical. And I would like to insist on the fact that uh, to us, Islamophobia has nothing to do with criticism of Islam. Uh, and we think that in our democratic society, Islam, as any other religion, ideology could or should be subject of criticism. But uh, there are some limits and we will uh, know uh, what we mean by that. Uh, the, concerning the victims of Islamophobia, uh, we have developed this cartography. And as you can see on this cartography, it's shared in two parts. First, on the left hand, we can see that the victims are uh, Muslims. I mean that they could be uh, people, individuals with practical, uh, uh, with, practi um, with um, visible practical, I mean, uh, because they wear a uh, headscarf, for instance, and with non-visible practice. It could also be, as I said, good uh, when uh, we uh, attack uh, some um, uh, halal shops and so on. And it could be institutions like mosques or Muslim schools. But uh, victims, we can find them um, in the real world, uh, as I said, for the previous victim, but also in the um, on the internet. And uh, you could also be a victim of Islamophobia, even if you are not Muslims because um, you only because you were perceived as such. And we usually received um, complaints from people who are not Muslims, but who are uh, victims of Islamophobia because they are perceived as such. And it's, for instance, the cases of uh, Roma women who were uh, the headscarf. I also recently received um, a complaint of a black woman who were wearing a turban who was perceived as a Muslims and discriminated against. So let's dive into uh, the, the, the core of the topic. So as I said, the main uh, topic, which is uh, 
for which we received a lot of complaints uh, uh, concerning the Islamophobia in the media um, is cartoons. So here are some cartoons, some examples. And as you can see on uh, these cartoons, Muslims are often associated to violence, blood, security threats, as you can see here. And um, even if uh, these cartoons are perceived by some Muslims as um, blasphem uh, blasphemous, or even if they are perceived as being uh, Islamophobic, to us, these cartoons fall under uh, the freedom of speech and expression. And we understand that in the rule of law, in a state of law like our, freedom of expression includes the fact of uh, shocking, unfortunately. And it's something that can uh, not be reg regulated by law. But uh, I think that this is the responsibility of uh, the media uh, outlets to pay attention to the fact of non-constructing uh, and propagating uh, negative stereotypes through uh, cartoons. Uh, secondly, uh, here are the most famous uh, cartoons in our database. First, the, this is this Danish um, cartoon, uh, which is portraying uh, the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, with a bamb instead of uh, a turban. And uh, this, we received a lot, a lot, a lot of complaints uh, related to uh, this uh, cartoon because it was um, perceived as uh, blasphemous and um, people didn't, uh, and people think that this um, cartoon uh, spread a lot of negative uh, stereotypes about Muslims by saying that Muslims are from the beginning uh, violent. And the second cartoon uh, is this one. So as you can see in this cartoon, this is a Belgian uh, cartoon. Uh, that uh, was published a few years ago, on which you can see that uh, we uh, have children on the in the first day of school in, oh, sorry, in uh, Molenbeek, which is a city, a very stigmatized uh, municipality here in Belgium. And uh, while all uh, children are uh, crying and calling their mom, uh, we see that uh, the Muslims boy is um, trying to slaughter his teddy bear and uh, screaming uh, Allahu Akbar. So we uh, received a lot, a lot, a lot of complaints concerning uh, this um, cartoon because um, we see that Islam, in this cartoon, Islam is associated to violence. And worst, violence is not represented as something, uh, as a crime through education, but as something innate to Muslims. And uh, according to the people who reported to us uh, this cartoon, um, this uh, cartoon um, is Islamophobic and incite to uh, discrimination and uh, hate crime uh, against Muslims. So uh, what we did at the CCIB uh, after this uh, bunch of complaints, we tried to report it to the national equality body who, uh, which challenged uh, uh, the, how we say this in uh, in English, the Journalistic Ethic Council, uh, the Journalistic Ethic uh, Council on the legal and the ethical dimension of um, this cartoon. But uh, after that, uh, after the analysis of this Journalistic Ethic Council, they considered that this cartoon uh, was uh, not in uh, infraction with the legislation and uh, with ethical uh, with uh, ethical rules. So what we, we tried to contest this cartoon and we tried to find a positive way, an original way to do it. So uh, to do this, we had the IT to counter negative stereotypes spread on Muslims through cartoons by uh, calling uh, cartoons uh, that tackling uh, Islamophobia, as you can see here, because uh, to us, um, it can help to um, to debunk we, cartoons could also be, could also could also be a very good tools to uh, debunk uh, stereotypes uh, uh, against uh, Muslims. So we received a very I think that we received more or less 
14th uh, positive cartoons, but unfortunately due to uh, technical issues with my Dropbox, I wasn't able to um, give you some examples. So uh, now the second uh, topic, which is uh, mainly um, reported to us concerning Islamophobia in the media is the covering of Muslims uh, by some uh, media outlets where we can see that Muslims are often viewed through a security lens and they are cast either or as um, good or bad Muslims. Um, uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, um, European Muslims are much more than that. Uh, but, uh, but stories um, about Muslims who are violent or likely to act violently uh, dominate the imagination about Muslims. You can see it, for instance, in this uh, next uh, slide uh, through this image. Uh, so this image shows that there is um, differential treatment of some media outlet when covering ideologically uh, motivated violence. And we see that when the offender is uh, from a minority uh, as a Muslim or black uh, minority, uh, we often use, um, we often give um, information about his race or uh, religion, which is not the case when uh, the shooter is a white man. So we can see it uh, here in this uh, article as well. So um, I think that to us, um, this um, should um, bring, um, how can I say that? Um, I think that in each um, newsroom, before illustrating an article uh, about uh, terrorism, we have to see uh, and ask uh, if uh, the um, reference to the religion and uh, to uh, the ethnicity of uh, the perpetrator uh, is relevant uh, to, to is relevant uh, or not. So that's it. And finally, uh, the last um, uh, the last topic, which is uh, frequently uh, reported to us, is the Muslims, uh, the treatment of uh, Muslims women by the media. And what is mainly denounced first uh, of all is the lack of visibility of Muslims women. We often speak about her uh, about them, sorry, but uh, without them. Uh, we also often use the image of Muslims women for subject presenting uh, Muslim as not belonging to Europe or, or as others. For instance, there is an example uh, concerning uh, about uh, foreigners voting whites, uh, which used, as you can see, it's uh, an image, uh, an illustration of Muslims women to speak about these uh, foreigners. Uh, we also, denounce the fact that Muslims women... Sorry, can I ask something? Yes, of course. My French is very bad. What does the headline say? Sorry? My French is very bad. What does the headline say? Uh, how uh, foreigners voting rights can uh, contribute to integration of foreigners. Uh, my English is not perfect, so I try to do my best. <laughs> So uh, what um, we mainly denounce is, uh, as I said, the fact that Muslim women are rarely invited as experts, and we can find um, this in the Forgotten Woman uh, report. Uh, you will have the, the link at the end of my presentation, which is a report made by the European Network Against uh, Racism. Uh, Michael, correct me if I say something wrong. Uh, and this report uh, confirms that media tend to show a stereotypical image of Muslim women, especially uh, women wearing the headscarf. And this is mainly due to uh, stereotypes that we have on Muslim women. Uh, who, who are often perceived as victim, as submissive, and so on. <coughs> and finally, sorry, uh, when these women find a way to take part to the public debate, uh, unfortunately, they are often insulted inside the community, but outside uh, the community as well by uh, racist people and so on. And as you can see on the, this picture, they are also often threatened 
On this picture, we can see a French a Muslim journalist who recently uh, received death threats uh, after uh, her uh, participation to the public debates. So let's now, um, oh no, okay, I still have another issue. And uh, we also, yes, and very uh, important one, we also received uh, a lot of complaints from Muslims women uh, who, uh, I mean, visible Muslims women who find difficulties in accessing jobs in the media as they are, um, as their impartiality and neutrality are often questioned when they try to work for uh, a media to join a newsroom and so on. And we think that to uh, tackle this problem, newsroom and other forms of media should ensure more diversity in the workforce to better reflect our European societies, but to finish on a positive uh, point concerning uh, this topic is that things are starting to change. As you can see on the pictures uh, here in Belgium, for instance, in the French speaking side, we have uh, Muslims journalists uh, who were the headscarf uh, in Brussels and in the Flemish uh, side, we have also another one who is Lubna. Uh, now let's move to the study cases. So, uh, these study cases concern um, editorials or press articles which were highly reported to the CCAB and which brought us to take specific actions. For instance, this editor, uh, this editorial was published in a national newspaper and uh, it was about practice of Ramadan. And I think that we received more than 70 complaints about it because people uh, denounce uh, some uh, assertions, uh, which according to them contributed to spread negative stereotypes uh, concerning Muslims. And the, the word which were used uh, in this editorial were the fact that the journalists uh, qualified some municipalities as uh, Muslim majority municipalities uh, without any correct data uh, to, to prove this. And he also said that during Ramadan, public transport travels more slowly depending on the state of fatigue of the drivers. And the drivers in the city, uh, we all, we, we, we know that, I don't know if you know, but in Belgium, uh, the public transport in Brussels uh, uh, hire a lot of uh, Muslims, Arabic uh, men, and uh, because of that, this uh, journalist said that uh, as uh, the majority of Muslim uh, of drivers are Muslims, uh, it uh, the travels are more slowly during Ramadan. So what we did, uh, we tried to report uh, this to the journalistic ethic council and uh, try to. Uh, find a solution without going to the court or without introducing an official complaint and so on. So uh, thanks to the mediation organized by uh, the Journalistic Ethics Council, uh, both parties uh, after meeting agreed on the publication, on, on, uh, on the fact that they will publish on their site uh, the report about the mediation. And in this report, uh, they mentioned that um, they re the CCIB received the apologies of the journalists and the media and um, the thing and, and they insist on the absence of stigmatizing of stigmatizing intent from the journalist. So uh, second uh, case, study case is uh, this article entitled I uh, in English how the Muslims Brotherhood took Belgium hostage. Uh, it was published in a French-speaking weekly magazine. And uh, the main concerns that we had um, concerning this, uh, th th these articles is, uh, as you can see, the fact that these articles use uh, uh, photos, uh, illustration of um, Hamas protesters to speak about uh, Muslim Brotherhood. And the fact that inside this article, there were a table, oh, sorry, there were a table uh, titled the uh, Muslims Brotherhood Infrastructures and on which we, in which we, can, we found uh, the name of some uh, associations and individuals, uh, individuals who were behind uh, the complaints. The, the, the complaints. 
uh, with institutions. So as I said, the CCIB uh, had no other choice than introducing a complaints to uh, the CDG, which is the Journalistic uh, Ethic Council. And uh, after uh, this uh, complaints, the Journalistic Ethic Council considered uh, three, griev three grievances as founded. The first one uh, is that the titles and illustration which uh, was used were unnecessarily dramatized, were unnecessary because they dramatized the problematic. Uh, they also, uh, they also um, decided that uh, there was an absence of the right uh, to reply to the persons and uh, an insufficiency in the search uh, for the truth. But uh, the Journalistic Ethic Council did not accept our uh, complaints concerning the fact that we considered that the uh, accusations uh, of confusion between the facts and the opinions, the defamation, the evasion of privacy, and a lack of moderation uh, on the firm test. I will send you my presentation if you're interested in, and you will find the link to this, um, uh, to, to this case. Uh, now let's move to uh, Don Sender, if I may uh, give you some real, uh, sorry, some um, recommendation. First of all, I will advise you to not uh, rate for an event to, uh, dealing with Muslims, to establish a um, relationship with them. For instance, we are on the, in the month of Ramadan, it could be a good opportunity to create bridges with the Muslims community. Another uh, another good moment, for instance, is the International Women's Day. It could be an occasion to write an article with uh, Muslims women uh, among uh, all uh, women that you will interview. We uh, also uh, will advise you to not assume that all hijabi rearing or bearded men are Muslims. Not assume uh, that any person claiming uh, to present Muslims community reality does. And please, please, please don't speak about Muslims community or Muslims world because there are many Muslims communities and there is no Muslims world. And regarding the do's, I will uh, finish uh, with this recommendation. Uh, please, uh, as journalists, try to offer a more responsible and balanced representation of European Muslims as a diverse mix of ethnicity, language, and so on. Uh, give a proportionate space to Muslims' voices all, on all issues uh, in the public debate, not only on uh, the topic related to Islam and Muslims, Pay specific attention to the term and image used when reporting uh, about Islam and Muslims and consider whether they reinforce or uh, not uh, stereotypes. And uh, finally, do offer spaces for a more nuanced pictures uh, of Muslim women as actors, not only focusing on their supposed Muslimness. I mean, try to write stories about Muslim women not necessarily involving the hijab or the Muslimness. So here are some uh, good practices uh, in the image below. And uh, in conclusion, uh, do not underestimate uh, your role as journalist. Uh, you can uh, be uh, behind very good articles uh, with uh, propagating a very good stereotype, uh, very good um, idea about Muslims. Uh, and finally, uh, if I may, um, if you need, feel free to contact the CCAB uh, if you need to be in touch with experts on issues relating to Islam and the Muslims community. We are there and uh, here are our uh, details if you need to contact us. So I remain at your disposal uh, for q and I don't know if it's now or after uh, Mikhail presentation. Uh, we can have now, uh, if anyone wants some questions, have some questions or share some comments on this and then maybe we can have a short break before we um, start Mikhail's section. I have a question if yeah. I may. Yeah. Um, you showed this case of the this magazine Le Fif saying how the Muslim Brotherhood took Belgium hostage 
um, and some of the complaints were um, confirmed by this commission. How how does how did the magazine react? Because if I see something like that, it is on purpose. They it it doesn't look to me like they were genuinely uh, trying to make a balanced article. So so I wonder, did it lead to any self reflection or? Um, yeah, what was their reaction, and and were they open to no, no, they to, were to write different things, you know? No, uh, this article were wrote by a journalist who is used to, according to us, to uh, give a bad image of Muslims, and uh, the, the we didn't even try it to have a mediation uh, with her, uh, so we directly go to the. Uh, Journalistic Ethics Council, and they justify uh, the journalist said that to her there was nothing um, to there was no reproach to there was nothing to say against her, her job. So, and the, but the magazine the magazine decided to publish it, and and it should yeah. it, it, ah, it you meet understand. any standards. So what did the magazine say? I to be honest, I wasn't behind this case, and I. Ah. I don't know, but I can ask my colleagues and send you an email with all the details if you want. Okay, okay, yeah. Thanks. Monia, I see you raising your hand. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one of the questions that uh, I have is, uh, which I experienced it um, uh, last week, I reported something, I found something uh, on Facebook and I reported that Facebook uh, so Facebook replied that it is not against our community standards and so on. So it's not coming under a specific um, uh, rules or policies that we have. So my question uh, for CCIB is, uh, are you also uh, working with social media companies? Because most of the hate speech, most of the Islamophobic, uh, I mean, uh, message and content is happening online. Uh, apart from websites, so online mean I mean mainly on social media, and that is a bit difficult to track it and to find it and to tackle it. So, um, are you working with with these social media companies? Uh, I believe there is a still so much work needed uh, in terms of uh, uh, Islamophobia in social media. So there, I mean, their their policies need to be amended. Their policies need to uh, uh, incorporate specifically uh, uh, such kind of cases that you mentioned. So, yeah, my question would be: What is have you have you worked with these social media companies, and what was the result? Well, so. Okay, thank you for the question. Unfortunately, we don't work directly with the social media companies, but we do work with, directly with our national equality body, who, uh, which work directly with uh, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. So what we mainly do when we received uh, complaints about this image, like you can see on my screen, we report them to uh, the national equality body and we also if we know who is behind if we can directly identify the author of this um, image we can also introduce a complaint to the police and uh, we try to do the following of this uh, case with the national equality body but unfortunately not directly with uh, the social media and what we also do is we call our, we try to convince all our members, we send them an email or uh, a text or, to ask them to massively report the image. And often it works because uh, when we check after uh, two weeks, uh, two days and so on, it, all, it had already happened that image were uh, withdrawn from uh, the social media. Any other comment or questions? If not, I will suggest a 10 minutes break and then uh, we can come back um, 10 minutes past three. Okay, okay I think I, we can uh, start again uh, with Michael from the um, intervention from Michael. Yes. 
I will just share my screen. Okay, do you see my screen? Yeah. Good. Um, okay. Um, so if you if you I, I've taken off um, the view. So uh, if you have something to ask when I'm presenting, so feel feel free to say it out loud because uh, I don't see anyone on my on my screen. Um, so I want first to thank you for for attending this uh, um, this seminar and uh, and also to the European Federation of Journalists for organizing it. Um, I think hearing uh, the questions you have in your presentation, it's really uh, interesting to be able to address uh, uh, a group of, of, of motivated writers uh, like you are um, and, and uh, writers and journalists. Um, so um, in my in my presentation, I will try to to cover the, the following uh, topics. Um, um, and um, so portraits of Islam and Muslim, uh, of a couple of on Muslim women that will complement what uh, what Leila presented, and also look to uh, the portraits of also other minorities and believers in the media, and to find to to end up also with a with a series of of a, of a short yeah a short list of do's and don'ts. Um, I will not uh, go into uh, too much into the uh, uh, the covers of, of newspapers. I've just uh, taken those uh, photos um, that you can find on the internet. Uh, and in, I mean, if you if you take any uh, major uh, news magazine and um, in, in your countries, you, you will find problematic uh, covers. Um, but uh, I think it's also more important that to go a little bit beyond that. Also, of course, they are uh, important in framing the issue, but there is already quite a a lot of work on, on covers that you can find uh, also online. Um, I will try to look a little bit more uh, into the titles and the pictures that are used to illustrate uh, a number of papers. Uh, a number, uh, most of them are in French or translation of, of, uh, of papers uh, from, uh, from other countries. Um, some are in English uh, as well in German. Um, so what, what is important here for me is to show how they uh, do frame the understanding of a paper. This, of course, you, you very well know as, as professional. Now, what we what we hear often when we discuss those issues with uh, your colleagues uh, from different media is that, um, yes, I've been writing my paper, but I'm not responsible of the title. I'm not responsible of the picture. I'm not responsible of the cover, of course. Um, yes, we can definitely understand that, uh, but it might be here when we talk about the issue of Islamophobia, time that you reclaim a little bit of the ownership on your paper in the sense that when you write uh, something and in many cases I've had ex very good papers that have uh, been written on issues related to Islam and Muslims and then the the, 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 the title is, is, is screwing up everything all the pictures that are used to illustrate the paper so I think that as an author yourself you, it must be very frustrating from your side to see that the message that you try to convey is to a large extent disrupted by, by the titles that has been used at the latest so I think it's really important uh, that you that you also uh, yeah try to and I think it is said not easily done to, to reclaim your, your, your power on this, but maybe also engage in a more constructive conversation uh, with the graphic designers that are uh, then following up on the work that, that, you've, that you've been doing, because a lot of this is also played in, in that game between, uh, or that interaction uh, between uh, titles and, and, and pictures. And uh, we are all, uh, you, me, Leila, and all the others who are people of, of words and discourses, so we know how performative they are uh, on the public. Um, and if we still had to convince anyone of, of, of that per, uh, performativity or performativeness rather, um, I, could, I would like to quote, well, uh, uh, not positively, but as a, as a practice, uh, uh, the, what the, Victor Orban uh, has been experimenting a couple of years ago. So if you remember well after 2015, there was uh, um, a number of uh, refugees that were coming from, from Syria and this lasted for quite a while. Um, and uh, actually, of course, uh, Hungary refused to take on board any uh, refugees, and basically they were getting across the country. And there was, was a whole campaign, uh, and uh, I'm sure you've seen this uh, panel pictures of like trying to portray a massive influx and invasion, you name it, um, that were uh, displayed all over uh, Hungary. Um, and 
basically, uh, so really uh, putting a very, bringing a very negative image of, of migrants and Muslims, of course, the two being very much conflated uh, uh, in this, in this, uh, in this uh, propaganda, can we, I can say. Um, but the, 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 the interesting point of this is that when our members, uh, the members of INAR were discussing with the government, basically they were saying like, look, we have, and this is a very cynical approach to, to, to the issue, but that really is highlighting the point. They were saying like, how many migrants are in the country? Like 2000 or something? It's much easier to steer hate against them. And what we see is that the hatred against Roma and the hatred against Jews has been decreasing in parallel, um, which is which is really horrible to 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 hear, but actually that shows how massive discourses and the performative power is used sometimes very sneakily by 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 politicians. But um, but that that is indeed an effect because some some people, even scientists, are uh, today like discussing um, the uh, performativeness of discourses on 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 the people on the larger population on societies. Here we have a, a, a proof that indeed. It's in a way worked. Um, so that being said, is also uh, uh, the, the link that is uh, important between um, uh, the frames that we that we use and those frames in which we are as individuals embedded. Because um, titles are framing the articles, but often titles and articles are also the results of our own frames, um, and the frames are connected to our values as well. And um, this we need to often take a step back to be able to look at those frames so that we can see where sometimes we have the feeling of being objective or portraying an issue in a, in a, in a way that is reflecting reality. But the frame that we have been using to look at the reality is already orienting what we are going to, uh, to, to describe at the end of the process. Um, so it's not, of course, here an, uh, uh, an exercise of trying to police your work or to tell you what you have to write. I mean, uh, on issues of Islam and Muslims or on many other issues as a journalist, you have, of course, entitled to have your own opinion and sometimes can be also negative. Uh, well, that's, that's also part of the diversity of profiles and of opinions that you have in the society. And uh, we understand that uh, journalists and media have also to speak to this diversity of profiles uh, in the society. Um, but at least that we, we try to be even uh, to be balanced in what we report. I think that this would be expected. I, I don't think that Muslims would, well, some Muslim would, of course, expect that media is only talking about nice stories about Muslims, but the point is not about being nice, it's about being fair, which is a little bit of a, of a, of a difference that we need to appreciate here. Um, so so I, I would try to give here in the, in the following slides uh, some, 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 some reflections on what, what you see and probably what you, you could also take for yourself on how to uh, reflect on, on your own practice. Um, this being said, uh, moving to the next slide, I will not uh, also uh, talk about terror. I've been avoiding this because you've been massively uh, so receiving and informed um, about, about uh, the, the, the connection that has been made and the, the, the uh, un uh, happy uh, connections in terms of use of vocabulary that we have seen. Um, I, I, we can come back to this in the conversation if, if, if you wish, if you wish so. So what I would rather like to, to go to um, is a number of issues that we have seen in the media. I'm taking only two examples among, among so many. So it's the way of how we tend to Islamize issues often without uh, re realizing it. That is, uh, and this is, a, this has a long story. So Basically, the first paper is the is a, is a famous French magazine that was uh, um, uh, popularizing history. Basically, we have lots of um, uh, academics that are writing and in, in this in this newspaper in this uh, uh, magazine. Um, and it was about the coming to power to, uh, of uh, Taddafi in 1982, so uh, yeah, 40 years ago and early. And we see that already uh, the portrayal uh, through the, the drawing uh, of, uh, you know, victorious uh, uh, horse riders um, that are uh, brandishing the, uh, uh, the, the flag of Islam, or what is supposed to be the flag of Islam, is already putting an, 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 
uh, an Islamic spin, or if I can say, in the, in the revolution that Gaddafi did at that point in time. Well, there were many, many other factors that led to this man seizing power uh, and, and setting up its, its, its yeah, a dictatorship after what, what, what was going to become a dictatorship. But the, the fact that we only focus from the very beginning the, the, this issue on this is something about Islam, whereas it was more about uh, yeah, the popular uprising, uh, seizing resources, and all those kind of issues is also particularly problematic. Uh, problematic. What we see in the other example is a, is a bit more recent. So it's about one of the magazines that is published by the, 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 the journal Le Monde that you all know. Um, and that the, the title is uh, Are Religions Threatening Republic? The question is, it can be a legitimate question, no problem. The question is, why do you use a headscarf on a, on a statue symbolizing the Republic to talk about religions in general. You could have taken something very different, like a panel of all the religions, you name it. But this is that basically the only religion, well, either it's supposed to understand or to imply that the only religion really threatening the Republic is Islam, or that the only religion that matters is Islam. Whereas we see, and for those who are interested in the field of, of religion, that in all uh, religion today, the main region, of course, there are people that, that have issues with how the Republic uh, is, is organized and so forth. So here again, we see how an issue is being Islamized. So that is for any single issue that would concern even sometimes, yes, Muslim can be concerned, but not necessarily that the, the spin would be would be would be put on, on, on Islam, whereas it's not sometimes the uh, explanatory, the main explanatory factor uh, that that we that we have on the hand. It can be just one, but necessarily uh, the, the main one. Another way that we've seen also uh, uh, often in the media is how um, uh, they are uh, manufacturing, as I say, opposition and continuities. And here I'm taking again two papers. One, the first one on the left side is, uh, is a translation uh, of, the, uh, of a paper of the Los Angeles Times um, that says Islam and democracy, the impossible equation, uh, a religion that is always hostile to modernity. Right. So basically, when you start like this, I mean, what can you say afterwards? I mean, basically, there is a stand that is taken, even if afterwards you say like, hey, but the picture is more nuanced and everything. I mean, I mean, the, the understanding, the framing of the article started. And basically, this is something that is recurring daily. And I'm sure you've come across papers that are trying to pitch Islam and democracy, whereas actually these are two different issues. I mean, Islam is a religion, democracy is a way of how you organize a society. And uh, of course, there are overlaps on some issues, but definitely it's not as if a region can be per se against uh, a, a democracy and when it comes to islam it's such a diverse um uh, uh, uh say uh, <laughs> i would say world but to, to, to follow up what leila said i would not use this one but if you take the large uh, the, 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 the 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 largest muslim country today is indonesia and which is also the largest um the largest democracy uh in in the uh, area so that proves that uh, the two can absolutely work together the other one is about to building a continuity like uh, religion and politics from uh, Mohammed or Mahomet to bin Laden as if there was a, 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 a red uh, a red line uh, from 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 how Muhammad in this specific context in tribal Arabia in the seventh century uh, was actually uh, enacted again uh, by what Ben Laden was doing, and and that of course is is a kind of of uh, um, trying to envisage Islam as something that is extremely monolithic um, that we see uh, that as if across history the, the this religion had not been the same, and when we know that when Muhammad dies there is no religion called Islam, uh, basically. Islam is being built uh, historically, uh, like in the following two, three centuries, in contexts that are completely different. So it shows how uh, this kind of of of, of titles uh, can be uh, can be uh, completely misleading. Um, Another issue is about, uh, oh, sorry, yes, this one, and uh, sorry to be portrayed in this one, but I thought that the, the, the <laughs> image was interesting. So another one of, of the tropes that we have about Islam is about what we call the secrecy and taqiyya. Taqiyya is at the beginning um, a specific feature that was particularly uh, uh, developed into Shia Islam, uh, so the second branch of Islam, which is quite a minority, because uh, in the, um, say, basically the 9th, 10th century in particular, they were persecuted uh, in the classical 
uh, Muslim societies by the Sunni majority, and they uh, developed uh, um, theologically the possibility to lie about your own belief uh, so that you could be safe uh, and save your life. Yeah, so that's very very that this is where this comes from, and now it has been kind of interpreted as the right for Muslims and specifically the jihadis uh, to lie about their intentions, which is not definitely why taqiyya was done for at the beginning in the Shia world, but this now is being understood. And now what we see often is that uh, taqiyya is being used to delegitimize uh, people uh, that that are um, especially Muslims. And uh, for example, uh, I'm um, uh, regularly uh, being Muslim myself uh, accused of taqiyya. Even Barack Obama was accused of taqiyya. So it's basically you're lying all your life through. Um, so, but what is interesting, what I've also realized in doing this presentation is that this concept of taqiyya is very much, and this discussion is very much in the uh, Francophone world. If you see, I've been looking for the Spiegel, Süddeutsche Zeitung, The Sun, Il Tempo, Corriere della Sera, um, very few instances of the, even the concept of taqiyya being used. And when you go to, I just checked two, I know some, some are even worse of the French uh, newspapers, it's 48 uh, for Le Figaro and 28 for Le Monde, which is really massive. So then you see that within the French, uh, the Francophone uh, part of Europe, this is something that is massively debating and framing also the relationship between, talking about performativeness, uh, 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 about the relationship between um, Muslims, Muslim activists, and uh, the the rest of the I'll say the, the 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 discursive space of democracy, because if. Uh, people are considered as having a double language all the time, then what can you build basically? So that's really a, a specific issue. The one I wanted to, it's not just to show my face, I mean, you have been direct anyway, but what I found interesting in this one is again how, and this is a, a paper that was used like, um, I think it was an article that was published like three or four weeks ago. Um, the title is uh, Occult uh, Maneuvers Inside of the Cults. Um, it's something that is dealing about the, um, uh, the, cha uh, the chaplaincy uh, within the Belgian army, uh, because I'm involved there in a, in, a, in, a, in a conversation for various reasons. And what is very interesting is how a picture that was quite nice, actually, when I found it, joined to the title, makes me extremely Machiavellic uh, and trying to plan something bad for the society. Uh, but when you read the title, the, 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 the article again, that's uh, rather something very positive for me. But the spin that has been given uh, by the picture and the title is, uh, of course, uh, uh, extremely problematic and has been felt that way by, by many readers. So that's uh, also something that, that we see in, in a number of instances. Um, uh, another issue uh, that is also uh, that already uh, um, Leila mentioned is uh, the usual representation of, of Islam is uh, and where you have like violence, blood and mobs are really recurring features that we see. Of course, here is being portrayed through uh, it's, it's easier than, than just like pasting long articles. But this is something that you, 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 you we meet often first is like even in cartoons, you will see like uh, this association that is done by Islam leading automatically to violence. Uh, and, and, and when you look at the societies where this takes place, this violence takes place, there are many other factors than Islam to explain the violence that is happening there. As I say, again, took a country like, like, uh, like Indonesia, uh, well, uh, you, you don't see everything burning all the time. However, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's the largest Muslim country. Doesn't mean there are no issues, of course there are, um, but it's, it's, it's like, uh, again, the narrative that we have, and often we are very much imbued by this type of narrative. Another issue that when we talk about Islam and Muslims, and specifically when it comes to uh, explaining um, the situation in foreign countries, it's the issue of the Muslim street, the Muslim, the the the, uh, the, 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 the Muslim mobs and everything. And I don't say that there are not, of course, manifestations gathering many people, but it's often something like I talk about mobs, the street, uh, the the populace, or you name it, and, and that that really takes away the agency of individuals in this and try to always portray Islam as something that is threatening all Muslims as something that, that, that is uh, threatening, always acting massively with thousands of people shouting, erecting, um, which is something that we see uh, often. Um, and uh, the, the last one, which is at the bottom, the bottom left, um, is, a, is an interesting picture as well, because it's talking about uh, fanatism, 
its mysteries, its history, uh, the, the way it's, it's, it's working. And actually, uh, it is using uh, pictures that are coming from uh, specifically Shia celebrations, uh, whereby uh, people want to uh, celebrate or commemorate, sorry, uh, the, the martyrdom of uh, Hussein, which was the grandson of, the, of Muhammad and was killed in, in intrafamilial battles. I will not go into the details, but that is really an extremely important event. And a bit like some Christians are trying to uh, revive uh, the, 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 the martyrdom uh, of Christ uh, by also, uh, you know, uh, inflicting themselves wounds and everything. And uh, of course, which is very spectacular. I mean, I mean, taking this as an illustration of fanatism is, is just wrong. This, is, this can be, of course, understood in many different ways, but definitely this is not a sign of fanatism. This is here a sign of extreme devotion that, has, that might have absolutely nothing uh, to have um, uh, with fanatism. But of course, in terms of color, it's, it's, it's shocking. It's, it's, it's a punch in the face that you get, but definitely um, that, that, that is against biasing what is actually those images are actually depicting and what is also the topic uh, of, 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 the, of the paper. Um, what, is, what is also interesting is when you start and look into, uh, uh, I mean, you take a, a newspaper or magazine and then you, you, you dare like move or, or across the years, you will see that there are also um, illustrations that are uh, going across, you know, the, you, you have the uh, funds of illustration and then, I mean, the graphic designer would just pick the same every now and then, uh, sometimes with 40 or 20 years of difference uh, to illustrate the similar topics. And what is also very informative is sometimes even the content of the paper don't change. I mean, in 20 years, for God's sakes, we have had, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, the knowledge on so many issues has been evolving, being more complexified than just like resorting to things that were written 20 years ago. Don't, I don't say that this happened often, but this happened. And uh, so this is like missing uh, the, 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 the current research and, and, what, uh, and also the, yeah, uh, in a generation, societies evolve, movement evolves, there are tensions that are appearing and so forth. And it's a bit too easy to get back to what has been previously written, uh, written by, by some of colleagues in the same media. Another one still is also about, and it's a bit linked also to the Islamization of, of issues that I was saying to, uh, before, is how do you illustrate Islam as well? Uh, so it's more maybe for graphic designers, but still. Um, so um, portrait, uh, prayer is of course an important part of uh, Muslim life uh, or practicing Muslim life. Um, but it's, it's always the way it's being portrayed is sometimes a little bit, um, I would say, not putting people at their advantage or being neutral. So it's what I say, the bum in the air type of trope um, that we will see in many pictures, um, or we are connecting uh, the prayer as the only way to, um, uh, to illustrate Islam when it's not availed Muslim women, right? So for example, here we have a paper on um, uh, 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 fi uh, Islamic finance uh, products that have been accepted by the Dutch, uh, uh, the Dutch, uh, I'll say, yeah, um, the, the Bourse, yeah, or whatever, the stock exchange, sorry. Um, and, and, and the point is like, why a prayer? Why a mosque? I mean, what's the point of seeing people being, you know, kneeling specifically when you know that a large part of the Islamic investment in Europe is done by non-Muslim actually, who are investing in Islamic bonds. So, I mean, you see that there are also some disconnections between what then the, 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 the reality of the matter is and how it's being illustrated. And also then my point is how do you, can you try to illustrate better uh, the prayer in a more, I would say, human way that is not subtly sometimes dehumanizing people. And this is, for example, one uh, that was published a few years back in a, in a French newspaper where you just see it was at, uh, during a prayer at home during Ramadan, how people are just like, you know, in a normal position, standing in an, in, in an act of devotion that is uh, peaceful and, and, and not trying to be some sort of a weird gymnastic. Um, that is, of course, always most of the time pictures from behind, which is not at the advantage of, of the people in, in this situation. So an example of how to do these things differently. Another one 
Another issue that we see often and you might be confronted to, and this is a, also again a complex one, this is the unbalances of Muslim voice in the media. So um, here I'm just giving a few, a few examples. Um, here we have uh, on the left side uh, a magazine that is uh, entitled The New Thinkers of Islam. Another one, the Wall Street Journal, is a column that was written by Ayan Hirsi Ali uh, that was at the time in the, in the Netherlands. She was also elected for a while, I think, before moving to the US, um, and which is uh, someone due to her own life path extremely against um, Islam, put it that way. And, uh, and the last one, is one of the new uh, imam, uh, Shi imams uh, in France uh, that is receiving quite a, a, a very large cover uh, that was two days ago. Um, just Google them uh, uh, like a couple of days ago. I mean, 13 million 500 hits on Google, right, for, uh, for, Muslim, uh, for Muslim imams. Um, she's a good friend of mine. So just to put things very clear. Um, but what I want to say is that there is some sort of attention that we've seen with um, 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 among journalists. On the one hand, they are aware of the extreme negative portrayal of Muslims in the media. And so there is this tendency of trying to, okay, let's try to invert the tide. And we will try to talk to people that are bringing something new about Islam, new voice, new, new vision, saying that it's possible to uh, have an inclusion of Islam in Europe and all those kind of issues that the world will be better off, which is totally understandable. But at the same, what it, it generates at the end of the day is is that those voices are actually, as I would say, single voices, mostly heard in the media than all the other voices. The other voices are conflated into support of terrorism, anonymous voices, anonymous, anonymous terrorism uh, 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 testimonies, uh, or considered as, well, just the normal Muslim on the street. You see what I mean? Um, and uh, there are also other voices that we might not like. Uh, specifically, you, there are voices of... Um, uh, of activists or people that are more conservative um, that we do not want to hear, but the same way we have uh, we have accepted to hear uh, people that are from the far right, um, for example, or from the far left, um, so that are a bit in the margins and sometimes are not that much in the margins. Um, we have also to get used to hear and report as uh, maybe with, with, with some precautions, of course, um, but that would be important not to uh, to, to completely unbalance that way, because what it does at the end of the day, it weakens the people that are put it that way, because they are considered as the puppets of the media, and this undermines their voice within the communities in the long run. So I think we've also ought to be aware of those kinds of, of dynamics. Um, now, I'm only finished. I would just like to add to what Leila said uh, about, again, the portrayal of, uh, of, of women in, in the media, of Muslim women. So what we see is often black pack and niqab, I mean, uh, or ecstatic. Um, so it, it, it's very difficult to represent women in a situation that is of everyday life, on the job, um, on the street. Um, so, so something where they would be not portrayed as being threatening. Uh, when we talk about, you know, the veil, it's always go to the niqab, which is, which is a, a very, um, you know, marginal phenomenon to say, to, to say the least, and even forbidden in, many, in, in an increasing number of countries. So the veil is rather what we have in the, in the, at the bottom, bottom, uh, bottom right. Uh, this could be considered as a veil, so why put a niqab when we want to talk about that issue? And how also, why also portray often women as being often ecstatic? And this is not only for Muslims, as we shall say. I mean, there is also in the media when it comes to women and and religion in general, a tendency to portray women as being ecstatic or out of themselves and so forth, which is uh, also connected to, to, to deeper, deeper issues. Um, and again, here, um, I want to say this opportunity also to say like, okay, that we can talk about um, these causes or um, that can lead to, could potentially lead to Islamophobia in, in, in the Western media, but it's not only in the Western media. This is a Palestinian journal, Al Hayat Al Jadida. And uh, this is talking about uh, women in uh, Saudi Arabia. And the way they do portray those women is uh, not very sympathetic, but get, trying to show the way how women in Saudi Arabia should be like uh, fat, eating, eating ice cream, not nothing, having, having anything to do. And the article is about uh, uh, one of the funny uh, issues that uh, you have in this uh, in the societies um, is uh, you know they cannot stay uh, with a non a, 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 a man to which with women they are not married or they could be married with or have sexual interaction with. 
So one way to get around that uh, is, a, is, a, is a fatwa that says that if they give their um, breast the milk, um, their drivers in this case, then they could be in the same car than them. I can go into more details with those very strange types of fatwa, um, but this is the point that uh, they wanted to make. But the way they portray um, conservative Muslim women coming from a Palestinian journal is also interesting to see that this relationship to, to women and women bodies is not specific to uh, Western media. Um, other ways is of more, these are more about building understanding and good practices, so explaining what is the difference between hijab and so forth. And there is quite a number of, of, of journals and media that have been doing this over the last few years to try to clarify the debate. Uh, there have been also, um, uh, like when there was uh, uh, the intronization of the new king, like also like, you know, taking pictures of the crowd uh, in Belgium and showing that, hey, yes, you can be a Muslim woman wearing the veil and being uh, also uh, supportive of the monarchy, willing to meet with the king and so forth. That it's not contradictory because for some people, but that might be contradictory. Um, one thing also that is important to do uh, is also uh, paying, paying great attention to what I call um, the homo Quranicus. So basically is the belief, and it's, it's extremely present, uh, that uh, Muslims are directed and operated by the Quran, as if the Quran was some sort of sof software that you have in your head and that all your life will be, uh, will be uh, uh, lived through that software. You will apply the software no matter what, all the time. So that's a, a preconception, a preconceived ideas on how uh, Muslims are functioning. But I would give you the credit that Muslims themselves are saying this, right? So this is also where we have to be extremely careful when we go and we approach and we discuss and we bring Muslim voice into the picture is that some might absolutely confirm that, yes, indeed, I have to respect the Quran in all my life. And actually, nobody does that really nobody because it's so hard um so but still there is this kind of idea that uh we will we would we, we would be uh, operating that way uh and the at the end of the day when we have this kind of preconception we are just giving you know credit to the most conservative forms uh, of islam and say we are all salafist in a way which is a which is a sect uh, um, in, in islam basically uh, that is with extremely literalist um, what they said this is what they claim um, and actually what we we, we, we kind of take their word for granted when we look at the whole um, spectrum of Muslim and way of living Islam, when we think that this is the only way to do is to fully uh, implement the Quran in your everyday life. Um, so that's uh, something I want also to pay attention to. Um, just to flag out also, and I was kind of hinting to this, is to try also to take a step back from uh, Muslims only and just try to think about often in the media minorities are portrayed, religious minorities, but not only religious minorities. And we see a lot of commonalities. Like you have a question in a, in a nice paper so about that has the title is Jewish and Belgian. I mean, would we ask Christian and Belgian? We would never ask that. So it's a way to put communities outside of what is considered mainstream Bel Belgianism or whatever, however you want to name it. Um, and, and you have the same also, of course, Muslims in Belgium and also Muslim and French, and you, you, you can decline this, of course, for all the, 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 the EU countries. But so it's not typical to the way Muslims are portrayed. There is a longer tradition and patterns of how a number of journalists are approaching a minority region, minority face, minority groups. We see also here then the the the, the the women, the Haredis here, and the, the, the subtitle is uh, the Jewish integrism uh, in uh, being revolted against laicity uh, and democracy, right? And here you have again the pack, the black, and the people that seems to be in another state, and that 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 could be so many different things, and uh, uh, not being necessarily against those kind of issues. You have also like the Basque movement, so to be a non-religious issue, that's also always the street, the mob that are often ways of portraying also minority political movement uh, in, in, in the media. And the same came here also for believers. I mean, the, I was mentioning the ecstatic women earlier, and often you will see that um, um, uh, movements will be represented, represented in with ecstatic figures, um, specifically if they are, um, yeah, um, I would say like 
sometimes mystical movements or however. And I mean, here you have on the on the on the on the right side, uh, uh, Protestants, evangelicals, candomblé, and uh, it's again here also about blackness uh, and uh, also minority face. I mean, you 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 could portray this in so many different ways that bringing somebody ecstatic, so it means that I well those guys in any way they're in another world, yeah. So bringing a disconnect between the readers and 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 uh, and the, the the reality that is trying to be described, and I will finish with that one. So a couple of weeks to go. Um, so being very much aware that Islam and Muslims are no neutral topic. I've never met anyone from whichever ground or whichever background that is neutral on the issue of Islam. It's it's. I could even say that Islam is a is a is a total social phenomenon. I mean, it doesn't leave anyone. I would say. Uh, uh, unchallenged or unquestioned or neutral. So people will always have a view. And I think as a journalist, um, you have to really be aware of that, that it will be extremely difficult to find a neutral view uh, on, on, on this, on, on, on issues linked to Islam and Muslim, including, and in particular, among the academia uh, that I also know quite well. Uh, I would say I would go to the basics, read a couple of books and papers. Uh, on, I've, I've been meeting people that really try to do a good job. Um, but I mean, their understanding of the issue is, is really minimum. So I think that sometimes uh, I know it's, uh, there's the pressure of delivering and so forth and so forth, but sometimes it, it, it's worth trying to find even like uh, Islam for the knees could be a good start. Um, taking the time to meet different experts, uh, reach out to different voice also to compensate uh, the balance, uh, uh, to balance the views uh, around this issue. Um, as Leila said, interview Muslims on any issue, not only on it, Muslim specific issues, but apparently from the poll that, uh, that was run at the beginning already do that, which is great. Um, what is also very important uh, when, you, when you talk to Muslim, and we've seen this quite a number of times, is uh, don't out Muslims. So that that that's really that's really key. Um, you you can't uh, you can't imagine the impact that it can have on their personal and professional lives. Um, so for and I had a case again, uh, like a, a researcher that is working on the training on this on 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 on, on of of imams uh, uh, recently. He is himself a professional trainer, and because he in a, he, he attended just to see like the first prayer of that imam, the chi imam that I, I Kahina Bahlul that I mentioned earlier. Uh, also, he had asked specifically to the journalist of the Agence France Presse not to disclose his name. She disclosed his name. She disclosed a picture of him, full face. And she even said things that were not appropriate, like well, not, not right. I mean, that he had daughters or whatever. And I mean, he lost 60% of his income because of that. Uh, as, a, as, a, as an independent consultant, I think you can have an idea of what it can, it can be. And there are many cases like this. Sometimes people don't want to be associated. They, they are Muslims, of course, but sometimes they just don't want their name, their face uh, to be given on there uh, in the press uh, because they know that it can have implications uh, on, their, on, their, on their lives. And specifically, in a, in a, in a, in, in the in the post terror or and the the, the 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 terror context that you've been facing for quite a number of years now. So I think that uh, that should not be underestimated. That you really check with the, the the people that you are going to work with if they are okay for their name to be uh, to to be given and to respect. If not, so I think that that makes your job sometimes harder. We fully understand that it's very difficult to bring stories and portraits of people, but I mean that's the the balance between information and 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 trying to also respect what the people can tell you. Get rid of the homo coronicus that I mentioned earlier. Um, pay attention also to subtle forms of, of, of hatred. Uh, so, so sometimes it are also not necessarily coming from journalists, but also in the, the discourse, like Islam is not compatible with the Republic that we hear often is, is a bit as stupid as Islam is not compatible with the, with the, the, the democracy. I mean, Republic has nothing to do uh, in France with, with religion, that separate, there's laicity and all those kind of issues. But the sub subtitle here is, Muslims are not compatible with the Republic. Yes, because individuals are constituting in a way that Republic are elected, participating to the life and so forth. And so it's a very subtle way. It's very difficult to disentangle those kind of issues. And that's why it's also used by a number of, uh, of people, politicians, uh, yesterday, a politician used that, that, that sentence again uh, in France uh, and it's making the headlines. So we see that this is something uh, quite important. Um, uh, be aware that you are an advocacy target everyone as a journalist 
of course, by Muslims themselves, also by different groups, also by people that are also uh, against, that have, that have an agenda against uh, the Islamization of Europe, or you name it. Um, I, and, 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 I, I, and it's like really the difficulties and the challenge for you to keep a critical distance with all the people that you are going to talk to. Why not falling into the, the systematic suspicion of double speech that I was mentioning, double discourse that I was mentioning uh, earlier? And uh, to try to give way to the complexities of life experience and pathways. And I can really say for myself, I mean, there are things that I was, when I was involved very much in the Muslim communities, I was not able to figure out because I had my own views on things. And it took me sometimes years then to come back critically and say like, hmm, actually, uh, I, I was not totally right in my analysis. But having made the way, I could be more clear about a number of issues. So it's not that people are lying to you. Sometimes I just really convinced of what they say, you know. So um, I think it's also important to, to, to have that complexity in mind. And finally, what I think uh, is also quite damaging to a number of papers is, you know, the trope of that many journalists like um, is to be edgy, yeah, to find the little angle that we make it, uh, you know, uh, a little bit interesting and the people will want to read. But actually, sometimes it, 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 it's, it's, it contributes to building, uh, as I say, manufacturing false opposition, you know, or bringing the doubt at the, at the last moment, the last phrase, just to, to try to, to, to make as if the issues are not so, so clear as they, as they were exposed and so forth. And, and sometimes, yeah, of course, you, we have to doubt, we have to, and, and, and some, something can, some, sometimes it can be edgy and you have to say it. I'm not trying to, again, police the, the work that you do, but sometimes you, you see it's just a just a, a small twist that is put at the end of the paper just to kind of uh, also show, hey, I've not been, uh, you know, falling in the trap of their double speech, all those kind of things. And I think it's extremely damaging to the, to, to the people that are being talked about and also to the quality of the reporting that you do and the broader public conversation that is being built on, on what, you, what you write. And uh, I will stop here. Sorry, I think I've been yeah, be a bit long, but uh, happy to... To, to pick up on your questions afterwards. Thank you, Michael. Do you have some uh, a poll to do as well? Um, no, that's fine. We can we can skip it. I think that's okay. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Then I would uh, leave some room for participants to react or maybe comments or maybe you also have some experiences uh, to share where you encounter similar challenges and how you deal with issue. Anna? Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you very much for this presentation. And I was thinking, I'm coming, I'm uh, based in Greece, I'm from Athens, and I can keep wondering that the things that Leila and you said, what uh, France or Belgium is uh, um, stressing about Muslims, uh, what they have to do with the colonialism and the colonialist policy, because we are closer to the Middle East and we focus to different things and we, um, we project uh, different stereotypes and these arguments for, for example, like uh, Burka or Salafism, this, they don't sell in, in my country or the Balkan area because we have a, another experience from the Muslim uh, communities. And we are, I think we're better educated about this because we have a, a long life uh, with the Muslims. But I can't help wondering what the, um, I, also I saw the photo you had with Algeria election. Uh, uh, so I can't help wondering what colonialism has to do and if they want to pass some political messages through blaming Islam and uh, painting Islam, uh, uh, but in the, uh, but actually uh, there is a deeper cause in this. Thank you. Should we answer directly, or or maybe we we, we pick a few a few questions? Uh, I don't see any hands now. Maybe you can answer, okay. and then if other questions, please. Yeah. Um. I will not go in too much into the decolonial framework because I'm not sure it explains everything. Um, I, I think because I mean the issue, for example, of, of course, when you take France and the relationship with Algeria, that's for sure that there is something 
um, that, that, that there is something there that can be definitely linked to the colonial past. But I mean, if you, um, I've, I've taken this picture, but I've seen the same picture. Uh, the, the other one was about Pakistan and French relation Pakistan is zero. I mean, basically, so, so there is no colonial past there. Um, and you would see it, uh, I mean, this is something that you see also in the, in the, in the US media that you, well, you cannot consider as, as, a, as, a, as a colonial power in this area, imperial suddenly, uh, but not colonial. Uh, um, so um, I think it's really a way of uh, that, that, uh, that, that I've seen. So I have not checked also the Lithuanian, for example, newspaper or the Polish newspaper or so we have had some, 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 some images on there. But I mean, there, there is this uh, representation of um, Islam as being numerous, as being a crowd, as being uh, concentrated and populated. And I think that this is, this is, a, this is a way uh, also. So it's, um, the point is, is that yes, if you look at the, 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 the Muslim societies, it's a, it's a way of expressing oneself to go to the street, uh, sometimes uh, not being prepared, uh, and people are expressing um, um, uh, emotions collectively, uh, the political demands and everything, much more than in Northern European countries where if you wanna make a demonstration, you have to, to get the trade union. So, uh, uh, you know, that's such complicated and it's not, that much a tradition of, 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 of the society. So I think that these are all those kind of interplays that are between how people conceive the political arena here in Europe and how they would report and also how they do conceive Islam. And on this one, there is a little bit of a conflation, but it's not only a question of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, pictures. It's also very much in the, the images that are used in the discourses. I mean, I've seen so many times the Muslim street what does it say? It just doesn't say nothing. So basically, it would, but it's so much more convenient to say that uh, when you have to, 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 to write fast, because maybe you have to handle your article, uh, you have just like one hour to write something and you don't have time to uh, review so many things and read so many papers and, and give a, a number of phone calls. Uh, that, that's, that can be convenient, but it takes away uh, the agency of who are the leaders, what are, what are they saying, what, what are the, the political demands that those people have and so forth, and why are they suddenly going to street, this is what we are going to see, and there is maybe five years of being patient under dictatorship, hunger, I mean, you name it, you know, and I think that th these are shortcuts that are often used uh, to in an explanatory way, whereas actually the, the, the situation is, is, uh, is so much more complex. And to be honest, like you had the, the, the yellow jacket in France, we were not that much using the, you know, the French street, yeah. because we know that there are much more, it's what's much more complex because we are, okay, our nose onto it. Uh, I mean, journalists could go and ask and talk to the people and so forth. So they would come with a more nuanced. Of course, there were lots of misconceptions as well, of course, but at least there was a chance to have a, a in, in the daily uh, the daily news, a much more uh, nuanced approach than just the street or the people or the mob. Um, so yeah, that is what I just wanted to share. And uh, basically, on, also on your question of the burqa and so forth, um, um, I, I, yes, I, I hear that uh, uh, through uh, in Greece uh, uh, there might be uh, some specific in the Balkans, uh, but there are other ways that are that I haven't talked about. Uh, for example, for me, if you look at Greece, Austria, um, um, Bulgaria, to a certain extent, there is a, some sort of, a, how could I say, some sort of a, 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 an anti-colonial twist uh, to the way they portray Islam. So basically, they, these are societies that see themselves as having been colonized by the Turkish uh, or the, the Ottoman Empire. And basically, it's, uh, and, and, and so I think it's something that we have to also disentangle the way they, they would read Islam is through their own history of, uh, of, uh, of domination by the Ottoman Empire. And of course, maybe the polka is not there yet, but believe me, it will be in your media in a few, a few years down the line, uh, as we see that uh, the French uh, discourse on it has been influencing the, 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 the English discourse on the issue. And so it's, um, it's something that is images that are circulating and that will be used at some point uh, down, down the line but yeah the situation i think it would be interesting i'm just like i mean if we could have austrians greeks and others so just to try to understand the experience of uh, ottoman domination and how they were taken away from their universalism and so forth and maybe uh, use this to help um 
other parts of Europe that were colonial power to understand why societies that were colonized react this way, because actually they're doing very much the same. You know, this rejection, this sometimes, uh, yeah, that, that, that opposition that can be seen and that just normal in a way, to a certain extent. Thank you, Michael, for the explanation. Any more questions or experiences to share? Uh, I would like to add a question. Uh, yeah. First, thank you so much for the presentation. It was very comprehensive, and I'm amazed to see all of those points listed and considerations. It's really great. Uh, there is one question I have, which is, uh, we are talking about the Islamophobia in the media narrative, but what about the uh, media industry itself as media outlets or media workplaces? Because also there is Islamophobia and uh, discrimination for minorities in general and Muslims in specific inside media organizations as well. So, uh, for example, part of my monitoring work is that I monitor the media narrative and I also monitor the workplace ethics because uh, I believe that you will not fix the narrative without fixing the organization itself uh, so I so are we going to include this as well like uh, how that def reflect inside the industry itself or uh, just about the media narratives um, that was just a question I had maybe just to answer you actually um, uh, we also include this but not uh, in the first sections it will be on the third section also we will focus on the issue in the newsroom uh, including what you just mentioned about the newsroom policy and also human resources management, for example, the issue about ethnic minority, the, the diversity in, in the newsroom, like uh, what kind of uh, ethnic background um, they have. So this issue will be addressed in a later on in the third webinar. Okay, that's great to hear. Because, as you say, that if we, uh, the people who put the editorial policy themselves has to be, uh, you know, like fixed first. So yeah, that's great uh, that you have included it. Thank you so much. Any more questions or comment experiences to share on this subject? If not, I can see the clock. It's a uh, four o'clock. And um, I can uh, close this uh, first section. And I would like to thank all of you for coming, taking the time and share your commitment and your passion on, on this subject. So I will see you uh, in two weeks time on the 7th of May, the same time. And I will send you, uh, me and uh, my colleague Laura sent you the link to register again each time uh, for the webinar so um so i'll see you next time and uh and for this first week we don't have any homework as such but more like a, a self-reflections following the exchanges with the experts and also with other uh, participants is more like a self-reflections then we can uh, start um, in two weeks time thank you so much bye-bye thank you michael and thank you Lena. Thank you, Tommaso. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.